Thank you for listening to the Bayina Institute podcast. Please join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Bayina Institute, or you can join our email list at httpbayina.com and share these recordings with your family and friends. <laughs> ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أن يقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنة للذين كفروا واغفر لنا ربنا إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم لقد كان لكم فيهم أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر ومن يت... واليوم الآخر ومن يتولى فإن الله هو الغني الحميد رب الشرح صدري ويسر لي أمري وحد العقدة من لساني يقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله اللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصدق آمين رب العالمين Inshallah, today in the first part of my khutbah, I'd like to talk to you about a little bit about the subject matter of nifaq, hypocrisy, and then specifically highlight one serious consequence of this disease that I feel Muslims at large need to be having a conversation about. The first thing I'd like to share with you is the, you know, the, one of the fundamental teachings of our religion, one of the summaries of our religion is iman. Like in the famous dua we learn in Surah al imran Allah Azza wa teaches us, Rabbana inna la sami'na munadiyan yunadi bil iman. We, we heard the call of someone calling, meaning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, calling to iman. So the entire faith, the entire religion is actually summarized at the end of the day to our faith. That's the essence of what we are as Muslims, is a people with a set of beliefs. And in all multiple places in the Quran, Allah teaches us that iman is something that lies inside our hearts. That it's some, that's a matter of the heart. That the Iman is part of its intellectual and part of it is a spiritual reality. Of course, the opposite of Iman is Kufr. So there are people who believe and there are people who disbelieve. Many of you are familiar with the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah Azza wa talks about the people who believe and the people who believe and then in the kafaru The opposite is mentioned. But then there is a threat to our very existence as believers from the inside. There's something inside, the potential inside every human being that can ruin their iman, that can destroy their faith. And that disease is nifaq, is hypocrisy. It's the most serious spiritual problem mentioned in Allah's guidance. In the Quran, in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, for a believer, the biggest danger in their life is to suffer from the disease of nifaq. That, that's, there's no worse situation you can have. There's nothing worse that, 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 that can be the case. And you know, when we talk about a disease, one should talk about, you know, why is it so serious? Nowadays, even when we talk about physical diseases, there are, you know, there's things like the flu or allergies or something like that. And then there are more serious diseases like, you know, cancer or whatever, heart failure, whatever else, heart problems. There are more serious diseases. Well, you don't know how serious a disease is until you know what it results in. Until the people know this disease, if you have this, then you're gonna, it's bad, you can't get worse. This is really, really serious. Well, that's why Allah Azza wa Jal didn't just warn us about nifaq. He told us about its consequences. And one of its ugliest consequences when Allah Azza wa Jal says, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّكِّ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ That hypocrites, people who suffer from this disease, are in the lowest possible pit of the hellfire. Meaning, the, the, the worst level of hellfire is reserved for these people. So this is pretty serious stuff. And people who suffer from it and have reached a terminal <laughs> state. You know how in diseases, you have terminal stages. When people, when somebody suffers from this disease and reaches a terminal stage, 
And then they become, you know, they say this person's hopeless. There's no more you can do for this patient. It's all you just is done. Sometimes Allah decla declares for some people, Allahumma la taj'alna minhum, Allah declares for some people that they are they've reached the terminal state, that there's no hope for them left. So for instance, Allah will say, Sawa'ul alayhim astaghfarta lahum, am lam tastaghfir lahum, lam yaghfir Allahu lahum. Wa ilun yaqul wa in tastaghfir lahum sab'ina maratan, lam yaghfir Allahu lahum. It's the same for them, whether you ask Allah to forgive them or not. Even the Rasul is told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even if you pray for them or not, it won't make a difference, Allah won't forgive them. Even if you pray for them 70 times, Allah won't forgive them. This is Allah talking about people whose, whose hypocrisy has reached a terminal state. At a, a terminal state. Now, this is the seriousness of the disease. But that, that's really the introduction that I wanted to share with you in this khutbah, is that the subject matter of nifaq is a very serious one. But then how do you, when you find out that there's a serious epidemic out there, there's an outbreak of a disease, you want to protect yourself. And how do you protect yourself? Well, they'll tell you, the physician, the doctor will tell you, well, if you see these and these and these symptoms, then you better go check yourself, maybe you have the disease, right? That's what we do with any disease. There's a, a kind of pathology, there are some kinds of symptoms. You look at those symptoms and say, okay, you know what, I should get checked out. So there are, in our sacred text, multiple signs of what is a munafiq. There are multiple indicators of what's a munafiq. And obviously the most obvious one of them is a contradiction between someone's speech and someone's actions. When you speak, you do something, and your, your speech is doing something else, and your actions speak to the contrary, right? So for example, Allah Azza wa complains about nifaq in Surah Al-Saf. And in Surah Al-Saf, He says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, lima taquluna ma la taf'alu. Why do you say that which you don't do? This khutbah today is about two ayat, or two, two places in the Qur'an. It's really about the beginning of Surah Al-Saf, the beginning of the 61st Surah. And then in, the, in conclusion, I want to share with you a very powerful dua that we learned through the followers of Ibrahim alayhi salam in the surah before this one, Surah Al-Mumtahina. I actually, when I was re reading the Masnoon part of the khutbah today, I started with that ayah. I started with the ayah that is recited by Ibrahim alayhi salam and his followers when they made the dua, رَبَّنَا لَا تَجْعَلْنَا فِتْنَةً لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَأَغْفِرْ لَنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ I'll mention something about that at the end of my khutbah. But I'll begin today, inshaAllah ta'ala, with just these ayat of Surah Al-Saf in the very beginning. You should know something about Surah Al-Saf. It's a Madani Surah. And in Medina is when the Qur'an really starts dealing with the subject of nifaq. The Qur'an made mention of nifaq, of hypocrisy in Mecca, which is majority of the Qur'an, two-thirds of the Qur'an, but it really started heavily dealing with this subject in Medina. And this Surah, most say that this is a little after the Battle of Muhammad, that the surah was revealed. There were a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, uh, obviously a lot of inner conflict inside the Muslim community. There were about 300 people that even walked off the Muslim battlefield. So there's a lot of internal issues in the Muslim community at that time. And Allah Azza wa Jalla begins this surah with a very powerful phrase: "Yusabbihu lillah, Yusabbihu lillahi ma fi al-samawat wa ma fi al-ard." I have talked about the musabbihat on many occasions. Just as a brief reminder, in all of the surahs that have tasbih in them. There's a comparison. First Allah talks about what everything else in creation is doing. Everything else in creation is declaring Allah's perfection. In the skies and the earth, it does what it's supposed to do, to declare Allah's perfection, to do what it's supposed to do. And then right after that, in every one of these surahs, Allah Azza wa turns His attention to the Muslims. And says, well every, everything else in creation is doing tasbih, what are you doing? So He compares us to the rest of creation. And says, you were made the best of creation. Where do you stand when I say the same, can I say the same thing about you? That you are doing the speak of Allah like the rest of creation is. I want you to understand this concept a little bit. Probably I'll spend about 10 minutes doing that, inshaAllah ta'ala. You see, Allah Azza wa Jalla in the Quran, when He created the human being, the angels were surprised. The angels were shocked. And they said, why are you creating this creature? And they even said, your tasbih is already being done. We're already here to declare your perfection. We declare your perfection already. We, and, and so, this word tasbih that I'm translating as declaring perfection should be understood. It comes from sabaha, which is to float. To float. When something is floating, it doesn't drown, right? That's the point. When something is floating or swimming, it doesn't drown. We're talking about Allah Azza wa Jalla, we're saying things about Allah that maintain His perfection. 
Now the moment you start saying something that is inappropriate about Allah, then you're making his status drown, and so you have to declare SubhanAllah. So in the Qur'an, when someone says something inappropriate about Allah, he says Subhanahu wa ta'ala, amma yaqoonuna unwan kabira. Subhanahu wa ta'ala amma yushrikun. Subhanallahi wa ta'ala amma yushrikun. Multiple times in the Qur'an. When people say inappropriate things about Allah, you say, no, Allah is too perfect for that. And that your way of saying that is subhanallah. You can't be saying that about Allah. Allah is too perfect for that. We maintain His status like something floats. We maintain it. We keep it where it's supposed to be. And we don't reduce His glory in any way. That's the tasbih of Allah. But the interesting thing for those of you that are a little bit familiar with the Arabic language, tasbih, the, the fit in the verb actually doesn't require a preposition. Like we read in the Quran, Yusabihuna, Yusabihuna hu. Yusabihuna hu. They declare his perfection. The Quran yakun Yusabihuna lahu. Yusabihuna hu. They declare his perfection. Even Musa alayhi salam, when he spoke to Allah azza wa jalla and made dua, he doesn't say, Kay Yusabiha laka kathiran. He says, Kay Yusabihaka kathiran. Wa nafkuraka kathiran. We declare your perfection. When someone declares Allah's perfection, we say, Yusabbihuka. Simple. But the ayat of Surah Al-Saf don't say, Yusabbihullaha ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard. No, no, no. They say, Yusabbihullillahi ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard. There's a lamb there. And that lamb they say is lamb al-ta'leem. What that means in simple English for all of you it is for Allah's sake that everything in the skies and the earth continues to declare His perfection. Intention is mentioned. When you say, I'm declaring Allah's perfection, that's one thing. When you're saying, I'm declaring perfection for Allah's sake, for the sake of Allah, for Allah, then you're mentioning your reason, your intention. And obviously, what's the problem with a hypocrite? The problem is in intention. So the surah doesn't even begins with clarifying intentions. Even the entire universe has the right intention. Where are your intentions? But even then, how does the rest of the creation, how does all of creation do Allah's tasbih? How is it declaring Allah's perfection? Every creation has a purpose. Everything Allah made has a purpose. And it fulfills its purpose. The sun has a purpose, the moon has a purpose, the tree has a purpose, the bird has a purpose. And it fulfills its purpose at any given moment. It does what it's supposed to do. And by obeying Allah in the way that it's supposed to, it is declaring Allah's perfection. That's in one of the ways in which it declares the perfection of Allah. So one of the ways we can observe the glory of Allah is the, the humility and the submission of the entire skies. The submission of the universe. The submission of the mountains that refuse to move. The submission that, of the water that quenches our thirst. The submission of the sun that provides us heat. It submits to Allah Azza wa It doesn't get out of line. Even the winds, Allah teaches us, they submit to Him. He holds them back until He lets them go. He gives them permission to go. Until then, they keep soft. And they don't hit you like a hurricane. They don't attack you. They remain soft. So now everything else is in obedience to Allah. Then Allah turns His attention to believers. Not just human beings. And that's another point to note here. Allah's best creation, Allah's most honored creation is us. Human beings. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمٍ We honored the son of Adam. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ خَلَقْتُهُ بِيَدَيَّ There are so many expressions in the Quran honoring the creation of the human being. And among the human beings, so if everything else lives according to its purpose, then there is the most expectation that human beings should live up to their purpose. If they're the best creation, they should meet their purpose in the best way. And within the human beings, there are those who actually believe in Allah's guidance. Believers. <coughs> so human beings are already have high expectations of them, but even within human beings, the highest expectations are of those who believe, isn't it? The highest expectations will be of those who actually claim they have Iman. Because they even know of Allah's expectations. They know the Wahi, they know the Revelation, they know the Rusul, they know the Messengers. Allah turns to those believers and says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. Why do you say what you don't do? Why do you say what you don't do? This is where we really have to understand what does it mean to do tasbih. Everything in the skies and the earth does tasbih. You can't understand how they do tasbih. 
They're, they've got their own language. But when we, when we think of doing tasbih, you know, when we think of doing tasbih, you think of a guy sitting there and he's doing the sunnah after the prayers, he's doing tasbih. He sings subhanallah, you're doing tasbih. You're saying alhamdulillah even though some people be hamdika. But if I put if I put alhamdulillah, even I have no with tasbih. Have a tasbih kalalik, right? This is tasbih too. If you say alhamdulillah, if you say Allahu Akbar, this is also tasbih. Because it's praising Allah and declaring Allah's perfection. So we have thought of tasbih as speech. That's what we think of it as. We think of certain adhkar, some things you memorize, like somebody says do tasbih, and you're thinking, say subhanallah. Say subhanallah this many times, alhamdulillah this many times, Allahu Akbar this many times. But in the ayah there's something interesting, I'll take you back to Adam alayhi salam for a moment. When, when the angels ask the question about Adam alayhi salam, they said, أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَا وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ Are you putting on the earth someone who will cause corruption? Are you going to put on the earth someone who will shed blood? He's going to spill blood. And we're the ones who do your tasbih. So the contrast to them was, on the one hand, there is a corrupt, murderous person. And on the other hand, we do your tasbih. You know what? Is it possible for a human being to do tasbih with their tongue and still be corrupt? Yes. They didn't say they're not going to remember you, they're not going to mention your name, they're not going to do, they're not going to say the tasbihat. They didn't say that. They said he's going to be full of corruption. Because to them, the opposite of corruption is tasbih. And tis, if you have tasbih, you can't have corruption. To them, the, that's the opposite. So to them, the contradiction was, we are doing the tasbih of Allah. Why would you put someone there who is clearly not doing tasbih of you? And what's their idea of someone who doesn't do tasbih of Allah? Someone who causes corruption. Someone who sheds blood. These, this is their concept of someone who does not declare Allah's perfection. You know why I'm mentioning that? Because for so many Muslims, they think they have done tasbih and they said subhanallah. And they're still corrupt. And they're still okay with the shedding of blood. How are you okay with that? That's not tasbih. That's just your mouth. And that's why in this surah, when it begins with tasbih, يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ لِمَا تَقُولُونَ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَلَا تَعْمَلُونَ بِهِ Why do you say subhanallah? And you don't act on it. You say tasbih with your tongue, like everything else in the universe actually says it and lives it. But you just say it and it doesn't show in your actions at all. How can you say subhanallah and declare Allah's perfection and declare that you believe in Him and then your character shows otherwise? This is a very serious criticism in the Qur'an. And Allah is so disgusted by this. Allah is so disgusted by it, He uses one of the ugliest words in the Arabic language to describe His disgust. He says, كَبُرَ مَقْتَرْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ How enormous! And kabura in the law by itself is enough. You don't even need a tabiz in, in grammar. You know? Kabura in the law is bad. Kabura maqtal. Allah fafihi tabiz. And this, this word to begin with, maqtal. You know, maqtal was used in the ugliest way in old Arabic. Maqtal is a disgusting practice found in the ignorant times before Islam. What they believed was women were property. They believed that women were property. So if the father died and he had four, five, six wives, the son would marry all the stepmothers. So he can keep the women in the house. And this disgusting practice was called maqt. This was called maqt. To give you an idea how disgusting Allah is, when He sees Muslims saying something with their mouth and their character is going in the opposite direction. Now, I share this with you because actually the central subject of my, my khutbah today to you, for which I have maybe 10 to 15 minutes left, is this dua of Surah Al-Mutahina. That was made on the tongue of Ibrahim alayhi salam and his followers. Allah taught us this dua. But something a little bit about Surah Al-Mutahina, it also deals with the subject of hypocrisy. From the very beginning, the issue is that of nifaq. And the Muslims are being told, watch out for your hypocrisy, don't become hypocrites. You know what? You should learn from the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And this dua is given. This dua has many benefits in it. I'll just share one or two with you. But before I get to it, I want to tell you why I'm sharing this with you. You know, today we are at an 
amazing information age. People have access to knowledge from across the world. People can see YouTube videos that are made in America and Indonesia and Bangladesh. We can see what's going on on the other end of the world and, world and get tweet, Twitter feeds and Facebook posts. The, the world of information has opened up to us. What scholars used to go travel for for years, now we can download in a few seconds. And you want the audio file, you want the PDF file, you want the print version, what do you want? It's all accessible to you in whatever format you want. You know, there are centuries of tafasir. Every century had major mufassirun. And you can find websites now where you can pick, do you want 3rd century tafsir, 4th century, 5th century, 6th century, what do you want? Pick the ayah, pick the tafsir in a split second. Even opening those books would take you one hour, finding the ayat. You can do that in a split second. In is available. Knowledge has just become available. And actually, even now, I feel like Muslims have an opportunity to learn their religion like never before. And that's a blessing from Allah Azza wa Jalla. There's not, nothing to undermine. But as we learn this religion, if we don't keep track of the fact that this learning is supposed to change our character, it's supposed to change the way we act, it's supposed to change the way we talk to other people, it's supposed to change the way you treat your neighbor, it's supposed to change the way you drive, it's supposed to change the way you go to work and come back from work. The way you interact with your spouse. The way you deal with your kids. If you don't remember that, then you're learning for no reason. Then this knowledge is of no benefit to you. Then you're saying a lot of things, but the actions haven't changed. Then it's, لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا تَفَعْلُونَ This particular dua, Ibrahim and his followers were very few. It's actually the only place in the Quran Allah mentions the followers of Ibrahim They're very, very few. And they made this dua and they said to Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Al-Mutahila, رَبَّنَا لَا تَجْعَلْنَا فِتْنَةً لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Master, don't make us a trial for those who disbelieve. It seems like confusing language. Don't make us a trial for those who disbelieve. One of the meanings of that is, Ya Allah, don't let us be defeated. Because if we lose, if the kuffar kill us, if the disbelievers kill us, and they destroy us, then they'll think, of course these people did not have Allah's help, because if they had Allah's help, we wouldn't have been able to destroy them, so they not, must not be on the haqq anyway, they must not be on the truth anyway, so now we are perfectly okay staying in the religion we are, our defeat will become a fitna for them. So don't make us victims of their crimes, and then they will think, just because they got away with it, that it's okay, we can stay on our own religion, that we don't have to change our way. Don't make us victims of the crimes of disbelievers. That's one of the meanings, but there's another very powerful meaning that a few ulama have mentioned. It's very powerful. Oh Allah, don't make us Muslims, don't make us the kind of people that when kuffar see them, please listen to this carefully, don't make us the kind of people that when disbelievers say, see them, they say, I want nothing to do with Islam. We become the biggest turnoff for everybody else to think about Islam. We become the turn -off. We become the reason why somebody wouldn't want to be Muslim. Don't make us of those people. And if we have already become of those people, well, fiddlana, rabbana. Forgive us, Master. Because our, act our speech is great, man. We got color brochures, we got YouTube videos, we got seminars and conferences, we got everything. We got pamphlets to give people. But when they ask us questions about our behavior, our behavior, I mean, I'm not, let's talk about, you guys have these table conversations all the time. The most corrupt countries on the planet, by any measure, by any measure, are Muslim. The biggest consumers of the wrong products, by any me measure, are Muslims on the earth. We are, why would somebody want to be like us? Why, what do we have to say as a people to the rest of the world and say, you should learn from us. You should try to be more like us. It's sad, isn't it? So many of you go, in your vacation time, you go back to your home country. You go visit Pakistan, you go visit Bangladesh, you go visit Egypt, you go visit Jordan. You're like, give safety to those places. And you go to those places and you spend two months there and your children say, I can't take it, Dad. We gotta go back home. I can't take it anymore. The streets are too dirty. The people are mean. Everybody's trying to steal money from us. They say, you're from Amerika, come here, come here, come here. 
Everybody's corrupt. My uncle wants money from me, my cousin wants money from me, the shopkeeper wants money from me, the police officer wants money from me, the guy at the airport wants money from me. Everybody's corrupt. The only language they speak is corruption. That's the common language among the Ummah today. We can't take it. You can't even go so much to, you know, to Hajj or Umrah or whatever even else, and the guy or the clerk will open up, he'll take your passport, he'll say, this passport's kind of light. Put some of money in there and give me back. That's become our language, corruption. And then the biases we have, the racism we have. As a people, institutionalized racism. I had a brother, I won't mention the country, he went to the Muslim world to study Arabic. He's, he's European descent, he's an Irish American. He went, he's blonde, blue eyed, white, you know, blonde hair. Remember his Quran before he went to study. And on the street, he's hanging out and people are like, why are you hanging out with that kafir? They're calling him kafir because he's white. Because how could he be blonde? become a Muslim. It doesn't make sense. He's Kafir, man. Oh, he's a spy. He must be a spy. And this is common. This is not an exceptional thing. This is common among us. This kind of ignorance is common. The distance between our character and what our, our religion is supposed to be. This last year, I went to Hajj. Alhamdulillah. No, I accept the Hajj of all the Muslims. But I, I, I usually, when people come back from Hajj, they experience a high iman, And I did, Alhamdulillah. But I want to share something in addition with you. If somebody has weak Iman, somebody has weak Iman, and they go to Hajj in 2013, oh man, I made dua that Allah protects their Iman. I made dua that Allah protects their Iman. You might worry about the ignorance of the people. No, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about how a Muslim who believes in Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can eat a banana and throw it on the street like that while he's reciting his tanbiyah. He's declaring Allah's perfection, and he's making the street dirtier. It's, it, 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 the two things don't register in his mind. He's making dua to Allah, he's reciting Quran, he's pushing, pushing an old lady so he can touch Hajar Aswad. Doesn't make any sense. You know, and I, and I thought about this while I was there. I was baffled. How far from our religion can we become as a people? We're, st we're spending the night in the sacred field of Muzdalifa. Muzdalifa is sacred land. It's blessed land. We're supposed to spend the night there in the once in a lifetime journey. This is the Amida is sacred land. This is not just any field, it's not a soccer field. It's sacred land. And when we spend the night there and you wake up the next morning, you cannot take two steps without stepping in trash. It's like you're standing in the middle of a dumpster. In the middle of a dumpster. Now you tell me, you tell me, in, in, in Washington DC, are you going to see a Coke can in front of the Washington Man Monument on the floor? Are you going to see a banana peel? Are you going to see a, you know, like bottle caps? Are you going to see people throwing their used diapers for their kids on the floor? Are you going to see that? No. Because they say this is, a, this is the you know, historically important territory. We should respect this place. It's a monument for our nation. My God, these, this is not even about, that's not even about Allah. This is Allah's sacred land. And we're the Ummah that believes in the sanctity of that land. We're the, we're the people that believe in the cleanliness of that land. Why would somebody want to think about Islam? And yet, despite all of that contradiction, people still come to Islam. People still say La ilaha illallah every single day. More and more people come to Islam. And wallahi, it is not because of us. Because we are not good examples of Islam. The Ummah is a very ugly example of Islam. We've become a very depressing example of this deen. This dua makes me shiver. Rabbana la taj'alna fitnatan lihnadina kafaru. Don't make us the reason why people don't think about Islam. You, have, you work in your office, you're part of a project management team. You're the only one that's late. Everybody else comes on time. You're the only one who parks in the wrong place. You're the only one who takes three hour breaks. You're the only one who makes excuses. Nobody else does it. And they say, man, these Muslims. SubhanAllah. From our workplace, to our business practices, to how we have become as a people. Even how we've become as a people. We can give a lecture about how Muslims care about the environment too. And how there are ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ about cleanliness and keeping the roads clean and all of that. And we can say, hey, look, we have these beautiful teachings in our deen. But come to a masjid for iftar in Ramadan and see how much food is wasted and how much plastic is being thrown out. And then give that speech. 
لم يبدا ترابط. ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنه للذين كفروا واغفر لنا فورجيف اس وي هاف تو ليف كم فار وي هاف تو جو باك تو بيكمين ديسنت بيبل اند اي اند اي دونت وونت تو ديبريس يو ان ذا سكوب اي هاف تو مينتس ليفت اي دونت بيكوز وي هاف ذيس كونفرسيشنز اول ذا تايم اي دونت جست وونت ذيس تو بي انذر كومبلين اباوت يو الله خبا وي هاف انف اوف ذوز As much as it hurts, and it's easy to complain. What do we do about it? What do you and I do about it? You and I, at least, we can be responsible for ourselves, our family, and our community. If I can't change the entire world, at least I can change what's happening in my household. I can stand up for the right thing. If I owe somebody money and I haven't paid them back, I should pay them back. I should say I shouldn't be. I'm a Muslim. I can't do that. I can't keep somebody else's money like that. I owe them, and I keep dodging them. Pay them back. If I haven't been, I haven't dealt rightly with my brother, with my business partner, I should fix that about myself. Don't complain about the Allah. Fix yourself. Fix what's happening in your family. You know, take care of your. You know, be responsible people. Change your habits. The habits that you know are wrong. If you know you have racist tendencies, bigotry tendencies, work on them. You know, this is stuff that we can do ourselves. Uh, on ourselves, and even especially into our children. I tell you, one of the biggest mistakes we've made is we think that we are teaching our children Islam when we teach them to memorize some surahs, we teach them how to make salat, we teach them how to make certain du'as, we teach them how to make wudu, how to do tahara. They know Deen, Alhamdulillah. Al Tifl Yarif al Salah. Mabruk Al Tifl Yarif al Salah. Walakin la yahtarim al Kibahar. Your, your child knows how to pray, but doesn't respect elders. Your child lies. Your child shows off at school. Your child puts other people down. He insults others. He uses filthy language. You know, we're not. We we we've forgotten that Islam it made amazing character. It built a personality. It built morals. Moral, ethical, responsible people. If you're walking around with a bottle of water in your hand and you can't find a trash can, you'll walk two miles and put it in a trash can. You won't just drop it. Your response is not an accomplishment. This is just you because you're a Muslim. You're a decent, responsible person. That's what you are. This is what we have to instill into our children. Even small things like they eat a candy and throw the wrapper. Even small things like that. What does that teach you? That teaches you that this this children may this child may know how to recite some things. But they haven't internalized what it means to be a responsible person. They don't know the importance of cleanliness. They don't know the, how, to, how this earth is an amana. You might think these are small things, but these are the building blocks of character. This is how character is built, or character is destroyed. <coughs> We, as Muslims, have to re-emphasize the importance of character. And until we do, we have almost nothing to show the world. We have nothing to show the world. If there's no character, there's nothing. The books will be there, and I tell you the last warning I, want, I give myself and to all of you: In tatawallo yastamil qom al ghayrakum, thumma la yakunu al thalakum. You people turn away. Allah says, I'll replace you with somebody else, and they won't be like you. I like to translate that as they won't be losers like you. They'll be real people. You better get your act together, because you're you're completely irreplaceable. You are completely replaceable. None of us are inexpensive, inexpensive. None of us. This ummah, the Islam does not need us. We need Islam, and when we don't respect this religion and live up to it, then we, Allah just replaces us with another nation. And so we beg Allah Azza wa Jal, Rabbana la taj'alna fitna tamil ladina kafar, wa fidna inna ta'ala al-Aziz al-Hakim. May Allah Azza wa Jal allow us to live up to the great legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam, and allow us to become a people that can uplift ourselves in our personal lives and our business lives. Even in the affairs of the Muslims as a society and as a body politic, that we're able to raise the ethical standards by which we live. May Allah Azza wa Jalla not make us of those whose speech goes in one direction and their actions go in another direction. May Allah Azza wa Jalla truly make us a people of tasbih and protect us from this horrible disease of nifaq of hypocrisy. May Allah Azza wa Jalla strengthen our iman and the iman of our families, and may Allah Azza wa Jalla especially protect and and strengthen the, the faith. And the courage, and the knowledge, and the wisdom, and the character of our youth who will carry the banner of Islam for tomorrow. Barakallahu li walakum. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa. Assalamu alaikum. 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 Assalamu
محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد نقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقل الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت من الحلوة والمدود